So before I start, maybe three disclaimers. Uh, first, I'd like to apologize for the experts in the room. The first half of the talk will be boring, and I apologize for the non-experts. The second half of the talk may be a bit more technical, so hopefully you're all happy and feeling well uh, for the lunch afterwards. And the third disclaimer, I am already hungry, okay? So uh, typically this puts me in a bad mood, and hopefully this will not show up today. So uh, just uh, to give some context, uh, given the title of the seminar, it's uh, rather obvious. So you have lots, uh, lots of data uh, everywhere in both science and industry. And here what I want to convey is that there are two magic numbers when you deal with data, with the number of observations you want to learn from. That would be n, because in statistics, n is always the number of observations. And, uh, and then p will be the size of those observations. Let me give you some examples where both n and p are very large. First, where the money comes from, like adver adver advertising. What is NNP here, uh, uh, or search engines? Uh, N, will the, N will be the total number of clients of those search engines, so N could be billions. And what, would, what P uh, would be here, that would be like the total number of websites uh, on the web. And for each of those websites, and for each customer, those search engines are storing whether you have visited the website or not. Okay, so is a store? whether you like it or not, it's a different issue. A big sparse vector, so why sparse? Because you typically have not visited all websites on the web. And from that long list of visited websites, they want to infer if you're going to like uh, uh, an advertisement or not, or they're going to rank the queries according to what you have done before. So this is my own account. When I put Tour de France, they know I like cycling, so they put uh, the Tour de France uh, first. So here, the input is, uh, a large vector sparse, uh, uh, and the output is, will I click or not on the advertisement, or will I, uh, will I uh, like uh, the first uh, outcome here? So this is most, where most of the money comes from, and uh, right now, uh, for those techniques. Then you can go beyond, and uh, you, you have probably have heard about like, a method to do like, image recognition. So here, what is D, what is P, what is N? N will be, uh, P will be the number of pixels in your image or the number of features which you need to represent your image. And N will be the total number of images you might want to learn from. Those two numbers are also rather, rather large. P could be of the order of millions or billion, uh, millions, millions of pixels or millions of features. And uh, uh, N would be the total number of images and typically millions, if not more, if you work in a big search engine. And finally, and this will be the last example. Uh, you can also save lives with those uh, type of techniques where you replace images by uh, proteins and you have essentially the same problem. Instead of trying to recognize whether you want to uh, see if you see a cat or a dog in an image, you want to classify if a protein is going to do whatever proteins do in, a, in an organism. And uh, so it's difficult because every protein is complex. Okay, so you, have to, you need a lot of uh, uh, features to describe the proteins, and there are a lot of proteins potentially, like millions for humans. Okay, so from my point of view, vision and bioinformatics are essentially equivalent. Once you define the proper features, then you can uh, learn, learn on them. But of course, uh, it's obvious that those are different things, and uh, uh, typically, yeah. All right, so, uh, so this is a summary of like, those large P, uh, large N situations. And the goal of today is to look at how you can uh, uh, learn from those types of data in the running time, which is the time it takes to read your data. So if you make no assumptions, to have N observations in dimension P, it takes O of NP uh, uh, running time. And you can go through that talk and replace O of NP by the number of non-zeros in your observations. So clearly, if you uh, work uh, for Google and N is 1 billion and P is 1 trillion, number of websites, if not more, you don't want to have a complexity which scales like this. You want to scale as a number of non-zeros and everything works that way and that omitting this uh, for simplicity. So as soon as you talk about running time, you have to talk about pertinence, uh, relevance of the predictions because if I predict by zero all the time, it's very efficient but not very, uh, not very useful. And the goal uh, of today is to mix uh, statistics and optimization. So I want to predict fast, but I want to predict something which is relevant. And one of the message is we are, most of the techniques used right now are going back to a 60-year-old algorithm, a stochastic gradient, uh, launched by Robbins and Monroe in 51. And the goal of today is also to show that 
Okay, IDs are similar, but there are still some improvements uh, since uh, then. So the talk will be organized as follows. I will mostly spend like half uh, of, the, of the talk uh, describing like current, current techniques, like a third. And uh, what we come up uh, uh, immediately is that there are simple problems and harder problems. And the goal is to be able to solve, to be as efficient for all of those. And then uh, uh, I will go over like least squares uh, uh, to show that you can be robust to uh, ill conditioning, even like complex problems you can deal, deal with them efficiently. And then I, I go uh, briefly uh, along extensions. All right, so to set up notations, I'm going to assume I have observations x i, y i. So you can see x i as being an image and y i as being a real number coding the presence or absence of, a, of an object in the image. And I assume they come from a stream of data which is independent and identically uh, distributed. And I'm going to consider linear functions, linear predictions. So not linear in the inputs, but linear in my parameter theta. So I assume that I know uh, some feature vector of phi of x, and I'm going to linear, linearly combine those, uh, uh, those features. So this is where you put all of this uh, expert knowledge. The phi of x for the web is simply phi of x equals x. I just look at linear combinations of my, of my data. For images, it will depend on like, shape, texture, and so on. And right now, people now learn that phi of x from data. It's not the topic of, of today, but if you want to fit neural networks into my talk, neural networks are essentially a way to learn as well phi from data. You parameterize phi in a given way using, using neural networks, and you learn both uh, uh, the, uh, parameter, the inner parameters, often the hidden layers, and theta will be the uh, at, uh, output layer. Okay, so this, in this talk, I focus mainly on the uh, last layer, uh, uh, theta. Now I'm going to consider empirical risk minimization, where I want to minimize the usual like, data fitting term, which I'm going to assume convex. Convex is my parameter. This is made possible because I'm using uh, linear predictions, and I'm going to, to use a convex, a convex loss, and plus some uh, uh, regularizer. So in terms of loss, uh, you can imagine the loss is a square loss. This will be the, simple, the simplest loss. Uh, this is typically adapted for a regression problem. But if you work with a classification, so the output is minus 1 or 1, like dog or cat, or dog or not dog, then it is traditional to predict as a sign, as a sign of your linear functions. And then uh, you can compute the number of errors that you make. So you make, you're, going to, you're going to make an error if the sign of y and the sign of your linear function are uh, different. And this corresponds to uh, the blue function, the 0, 1 loss, on the product uh, y times uh, your prediction. So you have, you, have a similar, you have the same sign, the product is positive. This is not convex, and like the last 20 years in machine learning, if not 40 years, I've come up with convex surrogates. And I will mostly mention the green one, which is logistic regression, which is like the typical loss used for uh, uh, doing binary classification. So from now on, I will not really uh, care so much about the loss. This will be a smooth loss, and least squares if you prefer, and some, sometimes logistic, which is this uh, nice uh, uh, green loss. So this is my, uh, my cost function. So this is my error on the trading data. And I'm going to add, uh, typically people add some regularizer to avoid overfitting. You want not to predict well on the data that you see, but data that you have not seen. So now you have two quantities which are really important for the algorithms analysis. The first one is what you can observe, the empirical risk. This is the same function as this. This is simply give me the data, give me your parameter. I can tell you how well I, I, I perform on your data. I will call that the training cost. But what I really care about is not this, I care about the testing cost. So this is where we're going to use that the data come from a stream, uh, uh, the same stream of data. I want to predict well on data which I have not seen, but of course come, uh, are assumed to come from the same stream of data. Hence the expectation here, which is with respect to the same uh, uh, randomness that has uh, generated your data. So the goal is, I'm giving access to f hat, the trading cost, but I want to minimize really the testing cost. And this brings two questions that people have tackled so far. Computing theta hat, this is a pure optimization problem. I don't really care uh, what it does. I want to, to find the global minimum. And analyzing theta hat is a pure uh, statistical question. I don't care where theta hat comes from. I, give me any algorithm. I will try to guarantee that minimizing f hat plus some regularizer is good to minimizing the expected risk. So the goal today is to do them uh, simultaneously, uh, de designing an algorithm that will be both efficient and predict well on unseen data. 
So I will need a few assumptions on my problem. So I, I go be rather quick here. I'm going to assume that all my functions are smooth. So this, this corresponds to bounds on the eigenvalues of, the, of the, all the Hessians. So on the left, a smooth function. On the right, a non-smooth function. OK, this is very simple. And in the context of machine learning, uh, as soon as you assume uh, the loss is smooth, this is a very weak assumption. If your data are bounded and you use logistic regression or least squares, you're always, uh, uh, you're always uh, 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 smooth. And this is a, what I call a weak uh, assumption. The strong assumption will be when you start to, to impose uh, some what I call strong convexity. So this is uh, the fact that your eigenvalues are not only positive, that would be convexity, but strictly positive with a minimal, uh, with a, with a minimal value of mu. So here on the left, in 1D, a convex function which is not strongly convex because you have a flat part over there. So on that part, uh, the function is equal to its tangent, and you cannot uh, have, like, you have a zero eigenvalue in your Hessian. On the right, a strongly convex function in 1D. So it's often easier to consider uh, in 2D. OK, so these are level sets of my functions. So this is a function with a large uh, value of mu compared to the, to the smoothness parameter, which is the largest eigenvalue. So the level sets are looks like balls. And uh, those will be easy problems because once I'm there, and I've, if I follow the steepest descent direction, I'm going to go really uh, in the direction of the global minimum, which is there. Whereas if I'm more ill conditioned, so I have a small eigenvalue, so I have some like elongated uh, ellipse like this, then if I start from there, the steepest descent does not take me there, it takes me more over there. So at the end, typical like gradient descent technique will start to oscillate, okay, and end up, end up somewhere like this. So here, of course, in 2D, it doesn't look as bad. But if you are in one million dimensions, then you have a lot of those directions which are very, very flat and on which you can oscillate, uh, uh, oscillate a lot. So why do I call this a strong assumption? Because in most modern problems, it's not satisfied. Okay, so if I take first, if I have finite amount of data, then uh, I, have, I have my, uh, my, my, lo my loss, uh, loss function. And if I assume least squares for simplicity, then the Hessians are all equal to the covariance matrix. And uh, this, this is the covariance matrix of end uh, data points in dimension P. So th the rank of this matrix uh, has to be less than N. So if N is smaller than P, it has to be rank deficient. So this means that its lowest eigenvalue has to be zero. So if you have a lot of features, this eigenvalue is always zero. Okay? So you're never in that, in that simple case. But even if you have lots of data, so I consider like big data, so n is very large, and you take any, any like modern data set and you compute the lowest eigenvalue of that Hessian, it will be typically zero and often very small, like 10 to the minus 12, uh, if not less. So this means that most modern problems are really uh, ill-conditioned. And what people have done is to add some regularizer to make it well-conditioned. But now if you do this, you start to modify your problem. Okay, you say essentially, that problem I don't like, I'm going to create a new problem to solve. So this means that when you add some regularizer, you should make sure that that regularizer is going to zero as you, uh, as, uh, you get more data. Okay, so mu typically will go, go down to zero as you, get, uh, as you get more data. And in this talk, I will not use regularization and try to tackle directly the problem. Now, those are our assumptions of the problem. Now, like uh, algorithms, I'm going to, con to consider mostly gradient descent type algorithm. So where you go from, uh, uh, you start from any point, and you go from uh, step t minus 1 to step t by going down the negative gradient with a positive uh, step size. So there are multiple ways of choosing the step size, but let's take a constant step size. And it's known that what will drive the complexity of those algorithms will, ex will be exactly the presence of absence of strong complexity. So here I'm assuming convex all the way, but I have like the simple problems where gradient descent will get me there very quickly, so here in one step, and I have like more econditional problems where I go, I'm going to oscillate. So you see like the 2D picture, and in terms of convergence rates, one of them is exponential. This is for the simple functions. At every time step, you cut down the error by a fixed amount, and this case corresponds to this 1 over t uh, convergence rate. So it does converge, but much, uh, much slower. Okay? So this is like the classical picture in optimization. Then you have a third uh, a second algorithm, which will Newton, where you replace, uh, you replace a scalar uh, step size by uh, inverting, inverting the system. So this is known to be 
uh, uh, much faster. You go from so-called linear convergence rate to a quadratic convergence rate. So you double the number of significant digits at every iteration. So this is very efficient in terms of number of iterations. But every iteration, you have to uh, solve a linear system, which is uh, p squared to just to form and p cubed uh, potentially to uh, minimize. So if you want to, to get the machine precision uh, for your problem, Newton is almost the only way to go. But there's a key insight for machine learning is that what we want to optimize G is not any, any function. So those are key insights by Leo Botou and uh, Olivier Bousquet and others before is that first, we don't really need to use a very high precision. Why? Because our cost functions are averages of random variables. Uh, of independent variables, then they tend to, the average tend to oscillate with a standard deviation one over root n. So before one over root, before one over root n reaches machine precision, even Google is not there yet. Okay, because uh, machine precision is 10 to the minus 16, and n is not uh, yet 10 to the 32. So first, we don't need to optimize really, uh, really like uh, precisely, and second, those algorithms do not leverage the fact that our functions are averages. Those work for any function. And the goal of today is really to look at techniques that can leverage that uh, some structure uh, uh, of the problem. So now let's consider what I call a stochastic approximation. So here, this is the, uh, the goal is to minimize the function f. But if you remember a single element of that talk is that in those techniques, we minimize directly the test error. So the goal is to get an algorithm to minimize a function which I cannot observe. Okay, the test error will be the expectation of the unseen data, and I just see samples. And so here I'm going to, the goal is to minimize the function f, which I don't observe, but I'm going to observe some information which will be uh, noisy, and I'm going to assume I observe like a noisy version of the gradient. So uh, this is the, the classical gradient, but I'm going to consider, to consider a noisy version. And of course, in our context of machine learning, that noisy version is uh, straightforward. I just take a, a random pair of observations. Give me x, n, y, n. This is random. The expectation of the loss is my test error, okay, by definition of the test error. And uh, this, is, this defines a small function depending only on the data seen at step uh, x, n, y, n. And if you're willing to uh, invert differentiation and uh, integration, then uh, uh, the gradient of my test error is the expected value of the gradient of my local function. Okay, so here, this is a gradient of that. So here, since I have a one-dimensional projection of theta on a vector, the gradient is proportional to that uh, vector phi of xn, my feature, times the scalar, which is a derivative with respect to the second uh, variable. Okay, so this is a classical setup where every time I see an observation, I can compute the, the, the gradient with respect uh, for the function uh, fn, and I get a noisy estimate of that function. So the key here is that we don't need the error uh, to go to zero. So typically, if you assume like non-random errors, and if you, make, uh, if you make errors that are not random, then even uh, with a tiny error, I can drive you far away from the optimum. So here, because uh, I have like a correct expectation, I can always convert to the global optimum even if the variance of those errors do not go to zero. So let's look at the classical algorithm. This is a stochastic gradient descent. And so here you go down, not the negative gradient, which you cannot observe, but the gradient of your, uh, your stochastic gradient, which I call f prime n of theta n minus 1. So here, in a very subtle way, I went from uh, index t to index n uh, as a way to highlight the fact that since we need independent accesses to the gradients, you need, uh, the, you need that the number of iterations is equal to the number of observations. So n, you stop after you have seen all of your data. Hence, I'm going to consider like uh, index n. I see data points once after the other, and I'm never going to receive uh, points again. So this is the SGD recursion, and I'm going to consider uh, averaging uh, on, on top of it. Another key point uh, here is that this averaging is not, is done in a sense not offline, but separately from the recursion. There is no interaction between the averaging and the recursion. We do not put back the average in the, in the recursion. Okay, so we compute, we do the SGD recursion and compute the averaging on the side, or more, uh, if you're careful, you update the averages uh, uh, online. Now the key question is, what should be the step size? 
Okay, so in the context of deterministic optimization, there are multiple ways of giving the step size, constant, line search, and so on. In the stochastic case, this is by far, uh, this was a, this really a hard problem. And uh, depending on uh, the books and the age of the books you're considering, people advocate different step sizes. So if you take the book from the, the 60s or 70s, they will tell you the best step size is 1 over n. And all the others are crap, okay? And uh, if you put, if you now, if you say now in the 90s or like the last 10 years, people will say one over root n is the best, okay? In a very straight face, and I'm going to do the same. Now, not one over n, not one over root n, but constant. Okay, take the biggest possible step size, and I will try to show that this is going to be uh, going to be efficient. But please do not use this one over n step size because it is known to be uh, non-robust for reasons I will explain uh, in, the, in the next slide. First, in terms of running time, so by design, it is over NP. Since I do a single access to my data, I read my data once, and that's it, and single pass, and also it's one line of code. Okay, so essentially, this entire talk is about how to modify this one line of code, uh, uh, bearing in mind that if you don't have like the thousands of lines of code to access your data, it's useless. Okay, so uh, big B. In fact, when I teach machine learning, I find it a bit uh, disappointing because what we teach is one line, but we need to code a lot to access data. This is true both in class and in practice, that the line of code here uh, is where learning happens, but we are nothing if you don't have this, uh, those other lines of code. All right, so why uh, a bit of existing work uh, for that? So it's known that Similarly to the uh, deterministic case, uh, strong convexity or lack thereof does drive uh, the easiness or hardness of the problem. And if you're strongly convex, then you, you converge with one over, uh, one over n mu. So here, at first, this looks, this looks a bit disappointing. Why? Because I went from exponential to uh, one over n, so which is much slower. But keep in mind, those are rates on the test error. This is how well I perform on the test data uh, compared to the best uh, predictor in my class. So this is like a learning bound, and for those learning bounds, one over n is considered as, uh, is considered as a uh, fast, uh, fast race. So this is achieved by stochastic gradient, and this is with a step size of one over n. So here you see uh, pointing the fact that this like one over n step size uh, from the 60s is correct for those well-conditioned problems. So if you have a easy problem or a small dimensional problem, then indeed that one over n step size is correct. But if you go like non strongly convex, so a bit more ill condition, then the best you can do is one over root n, and this is achieved with a, a, a much bigger step size, which goes down as one over root n. So here there's a bit of con uh, counterintuitive uh, uh, result, which is that if I'm harder, then I should, ma I should make bigger steps. Okay, so this is a bit counterintuitive, but this is, uh, this is uh, uh, what's happening uh, there. And these, so those are rates which are like uh, global and for all problems, even if you're non-smooth. Then there are people uh, like Polak and Judiski in the 90s, uh, and Rupert a bit earlier, that have, been, uh, that have showed that if you're a bit in between those step sizes, okay, then uh, you can achieve a, a rate of 1 over n without the presence of mu. So here there's a strong... So that talk is about like removing mu in 1 over n mu. But when mu is 10 to the minus 12, this is a big improvement. And those guys have shown that in the asymptotic regime, when n is large enough, it's not clear uh, what, do you mean by, uh, what you mean by large enough, then you can remove this dependence on step size, and, but you need smoothness. Okay, so the goal uh, today will be to show algorithms that can have the best of all worlds, which is I'm going to have a simple algorithm which will have a bound which is true for all possible n, okay, not only like in the asymptotic regime, and that will be robust to uh, 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 ill conditioning. So you remove this 1 over n mu to 1 over n, and of course, given that those rates are optimal, you have to add something in, and what I'm going to add is uh, smoothness. So let's consider like the simplest of all smooth problems, least squares. So this is, uh, this is a least square loss, so the square loss between y and my predictions, and uh, in that context, uh, stochastic radio descent is often referred to as least mean square, LMS. And there's a very nice book by Odile Maki on that. And uh, so here, again, uh, being uh, strongly convex or not depends on the uh, lowest eigenvalues of my covariance matrix, uh, which is uh, which I will call H uh, over there. 
So what we proposed with uh, Eric Moulin uh, a few years ago is to consider a constant step size, okay, with a very defined, uh, well-defined constant, which is a radius of your data. So give me your data, uh, phi of x, your features. Assume that all of them are bounded uh, in a Euclidean norm by R. Take that step size, which is that constant, does not decay with n. And then uh, uh, you get a, uh, a bound of, of that form. And I will explain like intuition later on. And that bound says, this is a typical like bound that we have in, those, in, those, in this field, where we're going to take f being the test error. Again, this is a test error, error on unseen data of my average estimator minus uh, f of theta star, which is the best element in my, in my class. So this is a positive quantity telling uh, how worse uh, I am compared to the best uh, estimator in my class. This is random initially because my data are assumed to be random. So I take expectations with respect to this randomness. And this goes to zero at a rate uh, uh, which is of that form. And it's 1 over n. So this is what we wanted. And there is no presence of any uh, smallest eigenvalues of mu, of h, excuse me. So this is robust uh, to ill conditioning. Even if you have some very, very flat parts, you still achieve this uh, 1 over n. And for the experts in the audience, we recover the sigma square p over n, which is the optimal prediction error for least squares, independently of any uh, uh, computational constraints. Even if you had infinite amounts of computations, you, can, you could never beat the sigma square p over n, and we recover this uh, as well. So let me explain why, it's, uh, uh, why constant step size is important. And this, we have a small detour through uh, Markov chains. So uh, if you look, if you look at the, uh, the square loss, if you look at my recursion, I have to compute the gradient of my, uh, of my square loss. So this is a square function, okay? So this is a residual times uh, my, my feature. And I do a step size, which is a constant step size. So this is one simple application of the computing gradients. And here, like all like, uh, stochastic approximation algorithms, those interest theta n form a Markov chain, okay? Because uh, the past randomness only depends through theta n minus 1. So it's like a nice uh, Markov chain for theta n minus 1. But when uh, the step size is constant, gamma is constant, this Markov chain is homogeneous. It's always the same dynamics. And hence, uh, if you're willing to make some assumptions, it's going to converge to a stationary distribution, which we call pi of gamma. So all like homogeneous Markov chain will always converge to a stationary distribution. So this means that when you start from an initial point, you're going to forget where you start from and then oscillate uh, according to a given distribution, which is always the same, independent of your starting point. So this means that this algorithm without averaging does not converge to any point. It always oscillates, OK? And I will call theta bar of gamma the expectations the expectation of this uh, stationary distribution. So this is what you oscillate uh, around. So it does not converge, OK? You oscillate. But the key uh, for least squares is that uh, the gradient is a linear function. Hence, you can show that it does oscillate around the best possible value, OK? Because the expected gradient is a gradient of the average of the expectation. And hence, you oscillate around the correct value. So now if you do averaging, then you're going to converge uh, 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 to the global optimum. And if you apply like one of the many versions of the ergodic theorem, you know that the rate at which any empirical average along the Markov chain converges to the, to the expectation under the stationary is of the order 1 over root n. And because I'm, I'm, I'm uh, computing errors in square norm, I get 1 over n. So from the start, I know that if I converge, because I use a constant step size, it has to be at a, a rate of 1 over n. So the difficulty is to show that in front of this 1 over n, there is no condition, condition number. And this is the main contribution of, of, of the work with Eric Moulin, is to show that a bound like this, where whoop, there is nothing appearing here in terms of condition. So now let's look at, uh, at uh, simulations to give you a bit, a bit more intuition on the algorithm, which is a first like big data in dimension uh, 20. OK, I, I go a bit bigger. I, I will go a bit bigger uh, in the next slide. So in all of my plots, I will always look at the, consider the number of iterations on the x-axis, uh, which is equal to the number of observations in a log scale. And the y-axis, this will always be the uh, distance to optimum in any measure uh, that uh, is relevant, so really in terms of uh, prediction values. And so here I'm considering uh, several uh, step sizes, a constant step size, 
of three different values of the, of the constant step size plus a decaying step size. In that plot, before averaging, this in a dotted, and after averaging, in plain. So if, as you can see, if, uh, okay, if you do a decaying step size, then you get like convergence uh, over there. But now if you do a constant step size, before averaging, you don't converge, you oscillate. Okay, so this, this is referring to the fact that my iterates converge to a given distribution, but not to a single, not to a Dirac. And you can see that as you take the step size smaller, from 1 over 2, 1 over 8, 1 over 32, you get a bit uh, closer to the global optimum, but you never converge. But as soon as uh, you start to do averaging, then you get a line like this. And that line, if you look very carefully, it's a, a slope of minus 1, highlighting the fact that this is a convergence is 1 over n. Yeah, so here, so the key here is to notice that uh, when you is to reach this uh, stationary behavior very quickly. And this is the effect of the constant step size there is that since you have a constant step size, you forget initial conditions very quickly. Okay, rapidly you enter this like uh, stationary phase where you oscillate about the global optimum and then averaging will, will get you there. Okay, so the bigger the step size, the sooner you forget uh, your initial condition. And this is why a bigger step size uh, helps. So now, like a big, uh, bigger data. So let me only focus on the, the left plot for simplicity. So I've considered two uh, classical benchmarks in machine learning, but classical at the time. I think now people go bigger. Like one where small dimensions of inputs, but a uh, like reasonably large number of, of uh, really large number of observations. A, a typical like web data where p is very big, but you have uh, you have a, a sparse data. So on the, on the you see like two columns. And I compare the step size, I compare the step size, uh, constant step size that will go uh, quickly uh, to a good value. And uh, this is like the decaying step size in green, which is uh, much, much uh, slower. Okay, so this is just to highlight the fact that the constant step size does uh, uh, converge uh, uh, much faster. All right, so lunch is getting closer. So first, um, uh, This uh, may look like a regression in the sense that, so when I started machine learning, this was like 20 years ago, uh, 15 years ago, um, uh, people were high on like uh, SVM. So SVM is just like a non-smooth loss. And then people like say, oh, SVM is complicated, may go like, may, 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 maybe go logistic. But clearly, we, will, we would never have been able to publish anything 10 years ago on least squares. Because these squares is not what makes money in practice, okay? If you do uh, Google, they use logistic because least square is not adapted. So you may think, okay, so why care about least squares? And for two reasons. The first reason, and I will present like uh, uh, why uh, in a moment, is that if you can do least squares, you can do any loss, any smooth loss functions because you can use like Newton type algorithms that will approximate locally your functions as being quadratic. So if you can do uh, least square, you can do Newton. Okay, so this is what I will do, what I will do uh, later. So I will have access to all uh, smooth losses. And for me, the, the key uh, why I like this square is that we can get a full understanding. Okay, so here, in the bound that I have there, I was able to characterize uh, the noise in my problem. So sigma square is the noise, my prediction noise, and the distance uh, between initial condition and uh, global optimum. So you can, you can separate those two effects and analyze them differently. And I think there's much more to be gained in terms of understanding and designing algorithms to make uh, improvements. So if you want to know more, I have a sequence of, uh, of students uh, that has uh, work on, on the topic, try to see if you can improve on those algorithms by looking at this uh, specific uh, square, uh, square loss. But now let's look at this uh, uh, logistic loss because again, In most applications, people consider losses which are non-smooth, uh, which are smooth but not uh, quadratic. So let's, let's try to see if this Markov chain interpretation still holds. So I have my Markov chain. So the fact that I have like a stochastic gradient preserves this Markov chain aspect. I have a step size, which is constant. Again, this is a homogeneous, homogeneous uh, Markov chain. So it's going to converge after a while to a stationary distribution pi of gamma, which will have a zero average gradient. But the key now is because the gradient is not a linear function, I cannot invert the gradient of the average is not the average of the gradient. And hence, uh, uh, I would not, the, uh, that gradient here is not zero. So this means that 
my iterates oscillate around the wrong value. Okay, so if I do have a regime, I'm going to converge quickly to the wrong value. So this is the optimal value, and I converge uh, uh, on the side. So this was known, of course, from before by several authors, that uh, constant step size uh, stochastic gradient is not convergent. You converge uh, uh, away uh, from, the, from the optimum. So uh, from the start, constant step size will only work directly for, uh, for least squares. And so what you can show is that before averaging, Uh, the distance from optimum will be a, a, a function of the, of the step size, the square root of gamma, and averaging does improve a bit, but still, this does not go to zero. So let's see this like in the exact same plot as before, but I've replaced the square loss by the logistic loss. So be, again, before averaging in dotted and after averaging in plane, and the non-average versions are the same as before. They don't converge, they oscillate. Uh, but now, if you do averaging, you go lower, but you, you, uh, uh, the curve stops improving, and you, this is just this highlights convergence, but to the wrong value. So if you get uh, a smaller step size, like 1 over 8, 1 over 32, you get to a better value, but still never, never converge. So this was known from before. And the goal now will be to restore convergence to uh, go something like a straight line, if possible, as, as 1 over n. So this is the goal for the, rest, uh, for the rest of the talk. And then we can uh, all have lunch. In fact, you, you know, already know everything to achieve this. And I've talked about all those four facts, which I will review now. And by combining them, you can essentially uh, uh, do uh, what I advertised, which is to restore convergence uh, uh, of the algorithm. What we have seen so far, this is work like from the 90s, is that if you do a stochastic gradient with a decaying step size, then you're going to achieve that rate which is slow, but this is going to be applicable to all functions, okay? Square, non-square, strongly convex, non-strongly convex. This is the most robust algorithm. It is slow. What I've shown uh, now is a bit the opposite. So if you, uh, not the exact opposite, but if you use a constant step size, this will only work for uh, uh, quadratic functions, but also in the ill condition case. Okay, this is what I've shown so far. And now, uh, what I've already mentioned is that Newton method uh, does uh, square the error at every iteration. So every Newton step, you square the error. And what I've already uh, mentioned once is that a Newton step, and I will show an example in like the next slide, will uh, essentially is equivalent to minimizing a quadratic function. So now you see all the pieces coming in. We're going to start by running some iterations of the super robust uh, algorithm. It works because uh, it always works. We get 1 over root n. And now we're going to imagine we do a Newton step from that, st from that, uh, from that uh, point. So a Newton step will square the error. So you should square this 1 over root n. So you should get a 1 over n error if you do a full Newton step. But now doing a full Newton step will be equivalent to minimizing a quadratic function, which is rather, uh, rather hard in, dimension, in high dimensions. But we can use our constant step size Uh, SGD to minimize this quadratic function. So now we're going to pay an, a price for approximating this Newton step, but the price that we pay is 1 over n because this is what I have shown so far. So at the end, you pay two prices. You pay the square of your initial error plus the fact that you do uh, an approximate uh, Newton step. And those two errors are both of the order 1 over n, and you get this 1 over n convergence uh, for this algorithm. So without any computations, you know you can reach this 1 over n. The key now, and I will then end up n like this uh, on, the, on that note, is that how do you make sure that this, this remains O of p per iteration? As soon as you see Newton, you should think about Hessians, and Hessians are of, of size p by p. So when p is 1 million or 1 billion, this is going to be a problem. And here, uh, there's a, a simple way to, uh, to achieve this. So uh, this is a Newton step, so, uh, because I'm going to need it uh, for, to prove that my algorithm is O of p. So you have a Newton step uh, like this. Uh, so this is like my expectation. I'm going to do a Newton step at a certain point theta tilde, uh, like that. And this corresponds to do a second order Taylor expansion of my function g around theta tilde, constant term, linear term, quadratic term. Those are expectations, because I'm minimizing an expectation. So it's just expectation, expectation. And I can put the expectation out uh, like this. And now, to solve that Newton step, I'm going to do a stochastic gradient on that one. So I need to compute the gradient of that function. 
So this is uh, what's happening there. I have uh, the gradient of that function. So this is zero gradient. This is one gradient. This is that gradient over there. So this is the, uh, uh, the, the recursion. And now you see the elements popping out. A gradient of the size O of P, a matrix, a Hessian, which is size P times P. So this, if you do this uh, in a brute force way, this will be P squared to solve. But now if you notice that for, we are considering linear predictions, where uh, so our functions depend only on a one dimensional projection over the vector phi of xn. So this means that the Hessian, they have to be uh, rank one. So, uh, so this is a rank one matrix. So I'm not going to form the matrix. I'm going to uh, take phi of xn, multiply by this, and then multiply this by, uh, by the vector. So at the end, I get like uh, the cost of two uh, uh, regular stochastic gradient. So I never need to form the Hessians. I never need to uh, 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 inverse the matrix. So how does it work? So uh, it does, uh, we can prove this o of, o of p over n uh, convergence rate. So this is something which we can prove. And, uh, but it doesn't really work. Why it doesn't really work? Because this is also very classical in optimization, is that uh, uh, algorithms for which you have a proof are not the ones which you really want to uh, use in practice. And the reason here is that for the algorithm that I've done before, so here, I've said I'm going to run first uh, an algorithm, stop, and then run uh, uh, least mean square uh, for the uh, Newton step. So this means that here I start by running my regular stochastic gradient. Okay, and if you look carefully, this is exactly the same plot at there. At there. So you run stochastic gradient with a decaying step size at n over two, and n being the last point. N over two, this is log scale n over two. I stop. And I say, but now I'm computing my gradient, my Hessians, and I do a Newton step with a constant step size. And since I have a constant step size, I'm going to oscillate a lot. So when I reach there, I'm already there, and I start to oscillate, okay? And then I go down, uh, go down faster, okay? So this is an algorithm which has the optimal bound, P over N, but not the optimal behavior. So what we have done as well is a, a version where you get like you update that total step at every iteration and we recover, we get the best of both worlds, fast convergence uh, as a one over n. So now let me, uh, let me uh, uh, finish, so let me skip this and let me uh, conclude. So, uh, so here, I the, the key talk is trying to be robust to ill conditioning. So this may look like uh, I'm just removing uh, one character from the bar, which is mu. But when that mu is 10 to the minus 12, this is really a, a strong improvement. And the idea is to uh, be robust to reconditioning and go from 1 over root n to 1 over n with uh, both like uh, theoretical bounds and a good uh, performance in practice. This was achieved by, uh, first by least squares. And the key is, I've not really mentioned it so much in this talk, but this is a robust to step size selection. Give me your problem, I can give you a step size. Whereas if you use decaying step sizes, you have to tweak uh, for quite a while uh, to find a good uh, constant of your, of your decay. So many extensions. Uh, uh, first one is going beyond a single pass. So what I've mentioned early on is that the bounds only hold if you do a, a single pass on the data. So you're not allowed, allowed to see a data point twice. You're not allowed for the bound. Of course, you can do it in practice. It always works better in the sense that multiple passes uh, does work better, but as soon as, as you do so, you lose the uh, uh, guarantee of the test error. So this is, this is still an open problem on how to merge uh, uh, analysis with multiple passes. For those who lack L1 norms, uh, to put like non-differentiable terms, like regularization, we can do it. Very, very recent work with my uh, student, uh, Nicolas Flammarion, essentially, all those like robust uh, uh, rates do uh, extend to the case where you add the constraints. If you lack like nonlinear functions, nonlinear predictions, we also have work with uh, another student. And I will mention like two uh, open problems uh, uh, which are, uh, which we are uh, currently working on. The first one is parallelization. So we reach a point where on a single machine we do, we being the community has optimal algorithms. Okay, so you see we're reaching the end of a single machine like optimization, not the end of applications, but the end of uh, research uh, on that. 
but many problems now have multiple machines. So data may be stored in different machines. If you do deep learning, you may have like GPUs, multiple GPUs on the machine. And here, at the moment, uh, uh, it's not working th that well. So most of the papers doing parallel algorithms, they parallelize the slow algorithms, okay? typically a decaying step size. So from the start, they consider an algorithm which is not the optimal one on a single machine. And then they show, oh, that algorithm, which is reasonable but not the best, is robust to uh, delays and so on. So they distribute the uh, uh, slow algorithms, and on those, they get a linear speed up. But compared to the optimal algorithm on a single machine, they don't get linear speed ups. And this is, to me, still an open problem, how to get linear speed ups for those fast algorithms. And early, our early work, our early work indicates that this may not be possible in the sense that there's a price to pay for parallelization, but more to come uh, in, a few, uh, in, a few, uh, in a few months. And finally, I have assumed always convexity, uh, uh, mostly for the analysis. Okay, so all of those like stochastic gradient algorithms, they don't need uh, convexity to run, they just need uh, convexity to analyze what's happening. And clearly those algorithms are used a lot uh, in non-convex problems, like in the neural networks, and we'll be interested to see if the guarantees which we, which we have on the constant step size can be extended to this non-convex problem uh, as well. Thank you for your attention. I was wondering if when you talk about extensions and future work on kernels, mm -hmm. uh, is it possible? I, I was wondering if it is possible to train a kernel machine online stochastically to, to So to we, we can, so yes, so, so here, uh, if you use a kernel trick, you can do online, but uh, you pay a cost of O of N square, okay? So it's online, but uh, slow, okay? Uh, so what the, uh, since those non-parametric techniques, they need to uh, increase, they have to be like more flexible as you get more data, okay? So they will never be linear in time. Uh, that's because it cannot be linear time, and what you hope is that they are linear time, they are sli slightly super linear, where the s slight uh, super linearity will be like, like a number of parameters, D, that may grow with a number of observations. And in many problems, that D will grow with N as a small, as a very small polynomial, like a square root or a very small power. And the hope is that to get that for the moment, we don't get that yet. We get N square easily, uh, we get ND square semi easily, but ND is still open. I see. And I believe that once those works, we can start back to compete with, the, uh, with neural networks. You just said that you think that kernel can start to compete on neural networks once you scale them? And yeah, then, uh, there's, there's nice work by uh, Julien Meral doing exactly this. Is that, so neural networks they were ahead for several reasons, one of them being uh, computation. So if you, uh, if you get uh, our things together to be able to run those algorithms on a larger amount of data and reuse the same GPU tricks, you can uh, do uh, quite well. And on some instances, Julien Meral has various examples where uh, you can run a kernel machine uh, efficiently with the same results. So is there some uh, probably converging algorithm where you would minimize the functional with an expectation, but it would not be uh, directly the expectation of a function, but the expectation will appear somewhere in your functional? I know that like, some people have worked on that, it's called like, composite stochastic approximation. You have a function which is, uh, let's say for optimal transport, we have such a, such a function. And uh, you take f of the expectation. Yes. And here, uh, people do things, but it's not as clean as a, as a current like expectation uh, directly. They have, they have some proofs of convergence by Meng Di, Wang at Princeton. Uh, but I don't know if this is for, I think it's for the slow rates. Okay. I have probably a naive question about the non-convex problems. What if the landscape is non-convex but has a unique min local minima, does it help? Oh yeah, okay, so what you can show for garden descent is that it will convert to a stationary point, okay? Yes. If you are smart enough, you're going to escape the stationary point and reach a local minimum. And if you, if you have a unique local minimum, you're fine. Okay, so your guarantees would extend to those cases Guarant somewhat. So typically, when you go non-convex, you replace, okay, typically you have to replace, you replace this like, ah, 
you replace, let's say, distance to optimum like this by the norm of the gradients that go to zero. So you show convergence to a stationary point measured by the norm of the gradient. And hence, if that norm of the gradient guarantees you that you reach the global minimum, you're fine. But this is, uh, but in fact, most of the techniques can, uh, yeah. So I think this is what people do when they go down convex. They first uh, show, uh, show convergence uh, of the gradient norm to zero. Mm -hmm.